Who are you and what do you do? So, my name is Gidi Peterson and I am the CEO and co-founder of Genomic Expression. And uh, what we are doing is we are sequencing RNA and matching the genetic RNA profile up against what you can call actionable targets that um, where drugs are interrogating those targets and making a report out of it so that you as a patient or a doctor can rationally select the most optimal treatment for the patient. Because the inconvenient truth is that only one out of four cancer treatments prolong life and that is why we are spending $80 billion on drugs and 8 million patients die every year. So when did you arrive at this breakthrough in the research? So I come out of the Danish biotech industry and I have a scientific background. Uh, so does my brother. And uh, he's actually the real geek in the family because he's got a PhD in genetics. And when my mother got diagnosed with lung cancer, we unfortunately knew it was a death sentence. So we started to look into um, the pipeline of new drugs and development and consulted with Jesper Soiton, who is what I would call a rock star in oncology uh, and also an entrepreneur who have spun out a number of drug discovery companies from the Danish Cancer Institute, uh, Denbrit, which is focusing on immune therapy, Gen um, GMAP, which had the largest market cap of any European biotech company at some point. I haven't checked lately. Turbo Target, it goes on and on. Uh, engineered the merger that turned into Centaurus. So his verdict was very precise, and he said, listen, you need to genetically analyze the tumor, and uh, you need to focus on uh, immune therapies, and in order to do that, you need to analyze the RNA. So that was how it started. And then we, we applied for grants, because early stage uh, funding mm -hmm. is not that readily available, and was fortunate enough to get into a very last project in Denmark that started in December of 2011 called Genome Denmark. And it was the first time Denmark took a big swing at cancer using sequencing. And it was a $32 million private-public partnership funded by the Danish High Tech Fund. And we were this tiny little done-after company, and we got a million out of it. But that was enough for us to develop a prototype of the sample part, sample prep part of the technology, and then subsequently we leveraged the non-diluted funding to get additional funding into the company to build a, a, a real company around it. And we attracted Tanya Kanigan, who's got a postdoc from MIT. He, she invented the, one of the first early genomics platforms that ended up in in, uh, Dana, in the diagnostic market called called Open Array, then she sold it to LifeTech. And Maud Middelfart, who's got two PhDs in uh, big data and data mining, and I think he started his first company when he was 14 <laughs> and sold it when he was 20. So he's also, all my, all the whole management team has a tremendous amount of what I would call startup DNA. And uh, that have brought us to where we are today, where we launched two months ago. We have two paying customers and we are basically launching at the right time with the right platform because now there's two immune therapies approved in melanoma and in lung, but they only work in 20% of the patients unless you profile them first. And that there's a very rich pipeline of these new therapies and you can speak to any oncologist or most of them I would say is it's the new gold rush in, mm -hmm. in oncology development of new immune therapies so it's, it's a very exciting time when somebody you know your average person out there is diagnosed with cancer they're um, from what I understand it they're put on this treadmill of treatment uh, irrespective of the, the particulars of their type, for example, of lung cancer, their type of breast cancer, and, and their own DNA, and the DNA of the tumour. So a, a very small percentage of the treatments actually increase longevity. Is that correct? So the, the way the numbers break down, if, if that's what you're asking mm -hmm. about, um, we are over-treating early-stage cancer in breast and 
prostate because we screen for those type of cancers and we are not able to using standard technologies which really just involves taking a biopsy, coloring the cells and looking under the microscope to determine whether the cells are uh, cancer cells or normal cells. Mm -hmm. And just because they're a little, you know, out of shape because you got older doesn't mean that it's cancer. But only using that technique will make you overdiagnose these early stage cancers, uh, early stage alterations as cancers. Okay, so so that means that the patient, if you are, if if you stay with the prostate cancer story in the U.S., where you screen and and I think is a little bit more prone to over treatments, you remove forty nine prostates to save the life of one man. When you move prostate, it turns into a continence mm -hmm. and other physical problems. So it's a real problem that we are overtreating, not just from a health economic standpoint, mm -hmm. but from a life quality standpoint. But isn't so, isn't the problem also not not just uh, over diagnosing as as it were or over treating? Yes. Um, yes. Well, well, I guess that both the two are related. But the thing that um, you know, in all the information that I've read about you and and what you've been doing, the the uh, the most um, worrying things I think about the current state of affairs within mainstream sort of cancer medicine is that I think I read that only, for example, chemotherapy works in 40% of cases. Is that right? <laughs> That's but, an overstatement. Oh, I see, I think right. the average is 25, but only a short period of time. Okay. So, for instance, in a case where it actually has um, a fairly good effectiveness in the initial stages is ovarian cancer. So mm -hmm. ovarian cancer will respond the first time but then it will come back. Okay. So and it only the, responds in some people. Only some yeah, people so, respond to right. that particular drug. And I think that's the point. It's rather than just the particular type of cancer, it's it's that cancer in that person. Yeah. So the standard of treatment for most cancers today is chemotherapy. Therapy is effective in between twenty five percent and what you mentioned, up to 50% in some cancers, but then it's only effective in between 6 and 12 months. So if you haven't completely removed every single cancer cell within that time frame, what happens is similar to what you see in infectious diseases, the cancer will continue to mutate against the drug pressure and it will escape the treatment. And that's when it comes back and it starts metastasizing and it's a completely different, more um, difficult animal to, to deal with. So there's a significant cost associated with not effectively targeting the, the genetic growth drivers mm -hmm. of the tumor. And how can you do that if you don't start out with analyzing the cancer? And, and again, I'm back to as a standard of care, what you do in most cancers is doing coloring the cells to look at them and see the shape. And then you may, depending on the type of cancer, stain and picture for overexpression. For, for example, in breast, you uh, mm -hmm. look for her two mm -hmm. hormone receptors because that will tell you if there's an opportunity to treat with a more targeted treatment, mm -hmm. Herceptin, or some of the drugs that basically modulate the, the hormones. So, but... It leaves all everybody else to stand up of chemotherapy and to continue the breast story. Triple negative breast sounds like a great diagnosis. It's not. It means that there's only chemotherapy. These patients only live on average two years. So there's a huge unmet need there. So your test is, is, is able to evaluate the type of treatments that will be effective for those these people. Yes. Similar so, to what Foundation Medicine did on DNA, where you get a report for the genetic alterations that are actionable, in that there's actually a drug that are targeting those genetic, genetic alterations, and that drug may be approved in your tissue type or it may be approved in a different tissue type. Mm -hmm. So this is another big paradigm shift that it is not completely irrelevant, but you have now success with treating genetic alterations if you treat a specific genetic alteration in long the drug that is approved for breast okay. same thing so so you need but because it's not approved for long you don't test for it and therefore the that's not the 
considered an option for the patient. Okay. Framework of, of treatments. Okay. You, you have a very um, clear video that explains this online. And at the end of the video, it says, if you are a patient or a doctor, get in touch with us. So how, how does the um, scenario work? For example, a patient X contacts you as a result of seeing the video and they say, I have a particular type of cancer. Can you help me? I'd love to have access to your test. What, what, what are the next steps? We, can we do three examples? Yes. U US? In the US, yeah. um, we will have to be uh, clear up in order to respond to any requests from any doctors or patients. Only sell this test directly to the doctor. Okay. Uh, however, we can um, exchange information about the test patient. We basically have some stuff they can download from mm -hmm. our website and they can bring that to the doctor in order to inform the doctor that this test exists. But ultimately, the doctor have to get in touch with us and order the test from us. In order to to do the test, we need a small tissue sample, whether that is paraffin embedded or we prefer fresh frozen uh, tissue. They send it to our lab in Boston. Okay. We analyze the sample and we send a report back to the doctor. Okay. Based on this report, the doctor will uh, have a, a conversation with the patient and they will collectively decide what to do next. What they decide to do next will be based on much more information than oncologists have been getting to date. Absolutely. And it will be ba still based on information that is very important to make a, a treatment decision mm -hmm. because we don't know anything about the patient besides what's in a, a very skimpy pathology report, mm -hmm. if it's long, is it smoking or non-smoking. Mm -hmm. um, but when you choose any treatment, you have to assess whether the patient is healthy and strong enough. To, a lot of treatments, even though they're targeted, can be toxic. Mm -hmm. okay, you know, Different drugs have different side effect profile. And some of them, not for patients with um, a, a weak heart, you know, that is something that the doctor has to make a decision together with the patient about it. If it's about getting enrolled into a clinical trial, um, some of the decision, important decision-making factors would be, where is that trial located? Uh, do I need to travel? Family need to travel with me? Uh, is it in a different country? Uh, how is this treatment being paid for? Well, uh, typically, when you enroll in a clinical trial, the, the uh, treatment is free, but what if I get sick from the treatment and I need to get treated? Uh, am I covered in this new payer environment? So there's many decisions that goes into the final, many parameters that goes into the final decision on, on how to treat the patient. And to, to what extent are you working on this together with drug companies? Because presumably so, so, if you align yourself to one drug company, that might not be, well, that, that might be considered too biased. Yeah, so I think that is, is, is more, what you're asking is more strategic decision. We will not uh, align us only to one company. It wouldn't mm -hmm. make sense from a commercial standpoint. It wouldn't make sense from a patient standpoint. And when you analyze the return of investment here in terms of getting this information, mm -hmm. the single biggest ROI is for the patient because we're really talking about the patient's lives yes. uh, and survival. So we, we have to think that uh, we have to align us with the stakeholder which has most at stake. And that's the patient. Okay. So that does not mean that we can't work with pharma because pharma, um, in different degrees, I would say, have realized that there's not going to be one magic drop that treats all tumors, period. And most of the big pharma companies are doing very comprehensive genetic analysis of samples, but they do it after the trial something okay. so what we are offering them is to use that information actively 
in selecting the right patient for that work. Okay. If I can take you back to we're giving me examples of um, if a doctor or a patient contacts you for the test, you gave America as one example, and you were going to give another two examples by way of comparison. Right. So right now I'm mostly familiar with the Nordic re region. You, we need uh, in in Europe in general, you need an ISO certification, which is very similar to CLIA, which is basically demonstrating that you know how to run a lab. Of course we do. And then you also need to get the SAC marked. And again, this is paperwork. Mm -hmm. It's not an approval like the FDA approval. In Europe, you're actually, in contrast, at, at least in Denmark, you're not allowed to market drugs directly to the consumer. Mm -hmm. But there is no rule or law that prevents you from marketing diagnostics. And, and I had this conversation, obviously this mm -hmm. has to be done very ethically, mm -hmm. but again, we are aligning ourselves with the interest of the patient, and I think we have an obligation to inform that this type of test exists. And again, in the similar, to, similar to the US version of the story, ultimately the tests have to be ordered by the doctor. We will not change that. Mm -hmm. We're not a direct-to-consumer uh, company. And how are you getting this information out there? Because this is something everybody should know about. <laughs> yes. So right now we're focusing on key academic institutions that we started to work with, mm -hmm. including the U.S. National Cancer Institute. And those relationships are very valuable right now and moving forward. We're also starting to work with some pharma companies. And, and that's where we're starting. We are very keen on accelerating the process to get it in the hands of, of more doctors mm -hmm. and we are currently going through some uh, strategic considerations on mm -hmm. how to accelerate that because again the patients really can't wait no if you're exactly, cancer, yeah. you you it 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 is you you're on a time limit so we want to accelerate that you're starting with um, the academic institutions, as you say. Have you Which considered treat patients? They treat patients, right? Have you have you considered just going straight to national media within main markets, so that you're so using the patient to drive the system? Very soon, but I will have to be ready to actually to manage it. To manage it because we we still in the scale up phase and. I do not want to disappoint anybody. So mm -hmm. we will not be able to handle very large volumes at this, this point. So we have to kind of scale it. I am an engineer, so that's one of the things that I, I know what it takes to mm -hmm. get from 1,000 to 5,000 to 100,000. And that's a process that we need to go through. So with that said, if somebody really feels very strongly with the relationships that we have, we can refer some of the patients to some of the academic institutions that we are working with. And that's, that would be how we would handle it at this point. If, uh, if an enormous company said tomorrow, I want to buy your research, I want to buy genomic expression, and uh, here's uh, $500 million. I'd be very happy. So would you retire? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good question. So I actually thought a lot about it. Obviously, we yes. have investors that um, want an exit so they can get their return on investment back. Mm. Um, it is very important to the founders of the company and it's very important to me and my management team that we deliver on our promise. And that means that whoever comes shows up with that check have to have a plan mm -hmm. and a strategy to bring it to the patients. If that's part of the deal, if that, back to what I said before, can that accelerate the access to our test, then it, I think it's a win-win. It's win for my investors and it's going to be a win for the patients. So under those conditions, we, we will look at it very positively. What drives you day to day in doing this? Clearly, to do something like this, it's, it's in terms of effort, it's beyond normal effort to do something like that. Because you're not, not only a, have you launched a startup, you, you're launching a startup which is bringing a product stroke service to the market that could save millions of lives. 
That's quite a lot for a person to carry. You, know, you can just stop there and say, this is, <laughs> you know, being able to do that. Yes. You get up in the morning and, and put on a smile and just keep going. Mm-hmm. So, but I also have personal experience with cancer. Both my parents passed away from cancer. It was a very frustrating uh, time and I miss them both. And I don't think if we have had that, at that time, I think they might have been here. I, I'm still in, in, in a situation where I battle cancer on a daily basis. My mother-in-law is a cancer survivor of four years. It's amazing. So, and I have friends. They call me up. You know, unfortunately, cancer is becoming the number one disease in terms of number of deaths. We have got very far with dealing with a lot of other diseases, cardiovascular diseases, which used to be what would be the number one cause of death. No more. We are living longer. If we live longer, our cells need to replicate themselves over and over again. These errors that causes cancers are accumulating over time. Thus, if we eradicate all over this, uh, all over the other diseases, we will eventually get cancer. So it is becoming the biggest. A toll on the healthcare system. It is becoming the big, biggest cause of death, and being able to change some numbers would be amazing. So that gets me up in the morning. It's a big problem, right? Have you always been this driven, understandable? Uh, given the uh, the area in which you work it carries an awful lot of responsibility with it. But putting that to one side, have you always been a very driven person? Well, everybody, yeah, I would say yes. And I think I even decided on my career based on understanding where I could have impact. So I called off Novo Nordisk uh, before I I selected what kind of um, education I wanted. I wanted to know what kind of people they hired. And when they said they hired engineers, I became an engineer, Uh, which was, by the way, super easy because everybody on my father's side uh, engineers and entrepreneurs. Uh, what what I have in addition to that is a mother who is very progressive, who was a politician, who wanted to change the world for the better. So if you can imagine growing up over the dinner table, it was about the existing of black holes and whether or not we should have atomic power in Denmark, which you know, I think the only person around that dinner table wanted to vote yes for that was my father, mm-hmm. because again, he's only an engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas my mom um, impregnated a great deal of social consciousness that have uh, guided me in in my decisions about where I want to be and what I want to do. And you work with your brother now. That's correct. We teamed up. You know, again, we come from. Similar backgrounds, I know him incredibly well, and I um, say this with a big smile. I think I have great uh, skill sets in terms of science, my scientific background. I have a degree in chemical engineering, I graduated uh, top 5%. I actually got a letter from Novo Nordisk where they asked me to apply for a position. It's the number one company that you want to work for but my brother is is brilliant in in a different sense he's he's incredibly creative dreaming up solutions that nobody else thought about and he ended up taking the phd right so i'm the classic geek and he's the real geek <laughs> and it's a you know i'm i'm not i'm i'm extrovert so i think i got that i think both my parents are pretty extrovert so i like I like being out and about. I like to meet people. And that's where I get my energy from. So I can't be in the lab doing that. How did you find uh, university and school? <laughs> I was very driven. <laughs> I, think, mm-hmm. I think I was the most boring engineer on the planet because I was, I was very... I graduated with extra scores at limited, reduced time. And that was simply... I, I wanted to get out and do things. I, I've always been very impatient. Probably a little boring. And and what about school? Before college? When you were much younger, what, what type of child were you? I was a tomboy. I was playing with one of my best friends, Birgitte Morgan, and we were horseback riding a vast amount of 
forest and making little um, shelters and really enjoying outdoor life to the fullest. I love skiing. Now I started surfing, wakeboarding, that kind of stuff. And why do you think you are this driven? I mean, why? I mean, you're obviously extremely intelligent and very accomplished. As, as, as a general observation of yourself, what do you think the factors are that make you this driven? I mean, your family environment, very, people were very, from what you described, very well-educated, uh, very rounded people, both entrepreneurs, engineers, and very sort of socially principled people. But in terms of the driving of yourself... What do you think the roots of that are? That's a good question. I actually don't know. <laughs> I think that... Did anyone ever I, tell you you couldn't do anything? No, no. That my, I think that it was my parents' belief that I could do everything I wanted to do. So, so clearly, my parents had a great deal of influence in terms of giving me the... Uh, self-confidence that mm -hmm. that was exactly the case and I, I never doubted that I never I never doubted myself so I think that's a, a very important part of it I'm trying to think what the alternative would be you know <laughs> I, I just I I want to live a life that matters yes what's the alternative you know that would yeah. be awfully boring <laughs> I, I don't want that so uh, no I just can't imagine anything else. Are you frightened of anything? Yeah, I'm afraid. The only thing, you know, we're living in a different days, but when I was very young, it was so the only thing was kind of my, my worst case scenario was getting married and bored, you know, to somebody <laughs> that utterly bored me. And that did not happen. So, so I think from that, you know, being trapped in a situation that I'm not comfortable with and not really knowing how to uh, get out was probably my biggest fear. And I think I very effectively prevented that from happening. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> um, day, day to day, is there anything that you're frightened of? Heights, lifts, flying? No. Nothing at all? The only thing today, I said again, today, I think we should be worried about what's happening in the Middle East in terms of terrorism. I think that is the only thing that I'm scared of because mm. it's unpredictable, it's unjust, it's driven by people who are very poorly informed and mm -hmm. manipulated, which makes them very dangerous. And that's the only thing that I'm scared of. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to really think about how to deal with it more effectively than we've done so far. Could you tell me a little bit about your mentoring and, and the women's group that you have set up? So you, you're mentioning Springboard? Is that, I didn't yes. set that up. Yes. I did participate in, in some other stuff a long okay. time ago mm -hmm. uh, called Kultur B96 in Denmark, but that's a very different story. Okay, but um, you're involved in something called Pipeline Angels, I think. And Pipeline Angels, mm -hmm. yes. So, but it all connects. So that Okay. When I was at Novo Nordisk, it became very clear to me just by watching what's going on in the company. It was a fairly big company. It was mm -hmm. growing fast. 30% of the new employees were women. But somehow, when you looked at the top of the organization, it narrowed down to four. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going on? Because, you know, I think everybody who has a degree would like to advance. And I created this project together with, it was a more hip, <laughs> if you can be hip and feminist, group mm -hmm. called uh, Female Company. And that's just translated from Denmark. Company means also company. So Female Company. And I got into the board. We got funded during uh, Kulturbyg Sex Alphems in Copenhagen to set up a, an art project. You know, trust me, I have no experience. You know, but it was a lot of fun. I literally got a whole group of women working for free over 12 months to do this. And what we did was we asked questions, why is this happening? And we created a document, I think there was 24 topics or problem areas to choose from. And then mm -hmm. we solicited painting from 12 artists. Okay. It was all photographies. And these pictures were exhibited as under the name 
everyday's heroes and heroines mm. in the canteens of 12 very large corporations in Denmark. Mm. Of course, Novo Nordisk was one of them. And during the month that they were hosted, we, with the management of the company, top management of the company, we arranged meetings for their employees in order to discuss why women wasn't advancing this particular company. And it was groundbreaking in the sense that that hadn't been part of the conversation mm -hmm. in the public space for a very long time. Like mm -hmm. my mom was a feminist and, you know, kind of uh, very naively assumed that the only barrier to success was just an education. And suddenly mm -hmm. you found yourself having an education, being bright and being in a big corporation. And it didn't automatically turn into... It was definitely... You know, some top leaders in some of the companies thought that women didn't want to advance, so they mm -hmm. didn't ask. And women thought, so, so we did get a, a lot of uh, reviews, and it was clear that women wanted to advance as much as men. So in a nutshell, so, what do you think the problem is? It, th that problem is that men still had a, a view of what women should do, and some older management in every single company kind of held back the, the women potential. And but do you, really what, what do, sorry on. to interrupt you, do, do you, do you also think it's a confidence issue on the part of the women as well, not asking? I think women are typically less aggressive in a uh, interview position. We communicate differently, but we measure or the same way as men. And if you're not aware of that, you make the wrong conclusions. So, so bottom line is that <laughs> it was a fantastic um, experience. We, I was on national television. I was national radio. We mm -hmm. had a lot of events around that. But to me, I, I basically, okay, I can sit here and complain about it. I can wait until mm -hmm. all the old guys die and then I will be old. I can change it. Yeah. So, you know, the way I change it is we need more women leaders in corporations. We need mm -hmm. women in top management and the best way for me to do that was creating my own company. Mm -hmm. I make the rules. I make the rules about advancement. I make the rules about how we communicate. And I like to work with both men and women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not going to have a company that is skewed towards one gender. No. So I think the way we solve this is exactly the way I'm stipulating here. We have to create companies that are created by women so how do we get that you know mm -hmm. I, obviously i took um, the job into this um but i can't create uh, enough jobs for mm -hmm. uh, and opportunities for all the women that are so talented so the way that i'm hoping to be able to do that is through organizations like springboard here in the states who over a period of 10 years have coached I don't know how many women it's they they raised a ton of money mm -hmm. and 85 percent of all the women they coach raise funding it's six billion dollars in total at this point mm -hmm. I think they coach more than 600 women I'm by the way an alum uh, mm -hmm. so I've been through the system it's a not-for-profit and now I'm participating on on the giving end of it as a coach for some of these women because mm -hmm. I've been through the process of having to figure out how to communicate to investors to get them to fund me and that's a skill set that I want to pass on. How does the coaching work? The, the coaching works mm -hmm. because you are taught to feel comfortable pitching not only your company an idea but also yourself. Okay, So mm -hmm. you and, and there's, there's a certain format to this. You, you probably heard about the elevator pitch. You have, I think, 30 seconds to get it across. And you have to be very um, fast. And there's a certain magic and a certain straightforwardness to that. So, okay. the, the, uh, so that's one component. But the other component, I have a very significant network in the life science industry. Uh, if somebody needs to be in contact with a particular CEO in a company, I can make that introduction. And I'll be very pleased to do that after they've been coached. So that, that's, it's like a network, basically. You recently won a, a Richard Branson Award. Can you? Not quite there yet. I'm in the top 10, but I can tell you I'm the only woman. 
Could you could you okay. could you explain a little bit about it? Yes. So this is the a pitch competition. So it's really about being able to communicate your idea to investors. And what is and it called? It's called Extreme Tech Channels. So and it's 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 sponsored by Richard Branson and a bunch of other companies. So there's a, a number of judges, and you have I think there's many thousands of companies that apply. I applied and I forgot all about it, and because I have a very large Twitter following, I suddenly saw on Twitter, "Congratulations, you are in the top 25." I'm like, "What? <laughs> what just <laughs> happened here?" So I had to go back and and find out what. That you know, first of all, I didn't believe it, and then then it was there. I was in the top twenty-five, and then I had to do some more interviews, and uh, now I'm in the top ten. So I haven't won that competition, but I'm in the top ten. I'm gonna present at um, a big consumer electronic conference in Las Vegas the first week of January. I'm very excited about yes. that. Yes. Um, I'm working. Uh, to perfect my pitch, you know, even though I know a lot about doing this, I can always be better. It's a slightly different audience. That's some of the other things you have to kind of change your pitch according to your audience. And I'm working with um, uh, uh, Jeff uh, Hammond from Priceline, sorry, Hoffman from Priceline, one of the founders, and he's been amazing, you know, mm-hmm. so... Now I've been coached by people who are, you know, incredibly successful, who are investing themselves, who's founded, you know, serial entrepreneurs, many companies, who's very familiar with uh, how to do it very successfully, and I'm being taught to get even better. It's if, amazing. If if you were mentoring yourself for this event, coaching yourself for this event, what are the three things that you would say to yourself to prepare yourself? Hire a coach. You, can, you cannot see yourself. It's very simple. That's mm-hmm. impossible. First of all, I'm so embedded in my own story. I know so many details. It's like walking through the forest. You can't see the trees, right? Mm-hmm. You can't do that without coaching. So, yeah. That's basically it. Also, I'm not. I'm. I'm a very um, structured, like a spread. I have a lot of data in my head, a lot of spreadsheets. So I'm very data driven. I do have pictures, but in terms of translating all that information into a beautiful slide deck, I'm not an artist. Certainly not. I need help to try and instill this level of confidence in let's say primary school age girls what would you say to them to to instill this level of confidence what sort of advice would you give them stop watching stupid television that basically tells you that you should stand in the corner and look pretty you know i stopped watching television 20 years ago i can't connect with the old storyline so that's one because you think the world is is like that like the little box, start watching stupid television, start reading books, start figuring out what you, um, what really interests you. You have to kind of feel it in your belly, uh, and then uh, get better at it. And and don't get discouraged when it doesn't work the first time. Anybody who is successful have got to that point through a lot of frustration and a lot of pain and you have to have a lot high pain level you have to be able to take it Mm -hmm. don't take critique personally because it's not you know critique is often delivered to give you guidance in terms of how to get better on the other hand if somebody's talking about your look forget about it right it's not about that so I think that you have to seek the right information to take control of your own education and your own destiny at a very early age and and pursue that. Thank you very much indeed, Peter <laughs> Peterson of Genomic Expression. It's been a real pleasure, pleasure to speak to you. My pleasure.